job. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh God, as I stand here once more at your sacred desk, I am reminded, as we just heard, it is only through amazing grace mm. that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are truly our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't believe the Acts text is printed on the back. No, nope, it says not printed. So you'll either have to take my word for it. If you have the Bibles, meet me in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to read starting with uh, verse 1. And I'm going to go down to verse. 15. That's good enough. I'll go yeah, 1 through 15 in Acts chapter 2. And it reads as follows. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia and uh, Phrygia and uh, Philia, Egypt and all parts of Libya, along to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs and our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing within with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Let us stop right there. Mm. Let us consider this morning for a theme. Are we speaking the same language? Are we speaking the same language? In this morning's text, we witness how the Holy Spirit created what I call a divine disturbance. Mm. Whenever there is a large crowd, there is the possibility of a disturbance. Whether it's sporting events like the recent Warriors game, political demonstrations, uh, first Fridays in Oakland. Mm. I don't know if they're divine disturbances, but they're disturbances. Uh, but they all can be right for some type of disturbance. One of the reasons we marvel at the civil rights movement was the commitment by the protesters not to engage in violent resistance, but causing disturbance nevertheless. And then you have those non-participatory onlookers that don't quite know what's going on, but they try to figure it out nevertheless. 
This is the story of Pentecost. In the New Testament, Pentecost marks 50 days after Easter. In the Old Testament, however, Pentecost marked the 50th day after Passover. Mm. So the Pentecost that Acts is referring is the Old Testament definition. Thus, these are Jewish brothers and sisters who have assembled. Now, I, I recognize the text says there were only men, but since the basis of all scripture is oral tradition, I, I'm holding out the possibility there were some sisters present. Mm. But the text goes as far as to say they were devout Jews. These devout Jews, 50 days since the Passover, 50 days since the resurrection, were divinely disturbed with such power that future generations spanning the next two millennia will continue to experience similar divine influence disturbances. Maybe not exactly the way it's recorded in the books of Acts this morning, but divinely disturbed nevertheless. Mm. For our purposes, the divine disturbance meant that old habits were broken and new ones embraced. It meant that love would replace hate. Compassion would replace coldness. Mercy mm. would replace cruelty. Come and on. hopelessness would take a back seat to hope. Mm, come the on. text strongly suggests to the onlookers and attendants it was a bewildering concoction of confusion, disorder, and chaos. People were talking, but they were talking in a very unusual way. Their passions overflowed as they openly conveyed the power of the Holy Spirit in the most unusual manner. Something new was happening. Change had made its presence felt. And some of those who did not understand felt the need to place it in a familiar box of comfort, ultimately for the purposes of soothing their own uneasiness. Mm. And yet this unpredictable, confusing, and disorderly chaos was summed up by the writer of Acts in a single sentence, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This scene of religious ecstasy had exceeded the boundaries of rationality, surpassed the limits of conformity, and went beyond the legal constrictions of orthodoxy. Even with traditional so-called mainline believers of today, this passage causes just as much discomfort mm. as it did for the actual onlookers of the event. For this passage is the basis for Pentecostal and Neo-Pentecostal religious traditions. This is where they find justification and divine legitimacy in the talking of tongues. This is also where those of us who do not speak in tongues find ourselves wearing the shoes of the onlookers of the text, mm. trying to fit our discomfort in the box mm. of conformity. But mm. our real discomfort comes in our inability to understand the variety of ways the Holy Spirit performs the work of amazing grace. Mm. So, as the text reminds us that there were many races, cultures, onlookers, different backgrounds and perspectives assembled under a singular banner of one religion, the real challenge lies in the ability of the onlookers to accept those who openly demonstrated a different worship tradition, mm. which in effect becomes a microcosm for our ability or inability to accept difference as a direct reflection on the measure of peace we experience in our own spiritual walk. Mm. In other words, if you worry about what someone else is doing, you ought to examine whether you've got peace in your own life. Come on. Yeah. What purpose does it serve to be bigoted, judgmental, or prejudiced in our theological application? Because nobody possesses the whole truth of God. I don't care what race you are, what class you are, what sex you are, what your orientation is. No denomination, no doctrine, no teaching can exhaust the limits of ultimate reality, what little we know should never be confused with being the absolute truth about God, nor should our finite, limited 
A minuscule understanding be understood as a tool to devalue the spiritual truths realized by others mm. whose tradition may look and feel different from our own. Man. Just because somebody don't worship the way we worship, Come don't mean that other person is wrong. Should the grace of God be measured by my narrow inventory? Should myriad faiths spanning over 21 centuries be reduced to my particular experience? Should the divinely possible be ruled down to fit within the contours of my personal moral compass? Mm. Moreover, our inability to accept the differences, differences in how others experience God may actually serve as an admission of our own uncertainty about what it is we say we believe. If nothing else, it definitely suggests a lack of peace mm. in my life. If God is working for me, I really don't have time to critique how God is working for you when okay. it looks different to me. This divine disturbance that speaks of unity, believers on one accord was met with opposition. Mm. We live in a world where forces of unity too often are met with opposition. Nations are divided based on rival systems of politics and economics and land, groups divided by class, race, gender. Mm. With the advantage of 2020 hindsight, when you think about it, it seems rather ridiculous that the message of inclusivity and love offered by the likes of Mohandas K. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. would be met with opposition. Yet both these brothers who offered non-violence were gunned down by violence. Mm. So I'm not surprised that some in the text that, that those caught in the vortex of the Holy Spirit would spread a rumor that they must have been drinking some of that new wine. Mm. They didn't understand what was going on. They were uncomfortable. And they needed to make sense of it. We must never forget there is a wideness to God's love. For the love of God is greater than the measure of our minds. Mm, Salvation on. is not a concept limited to one's denominational affiliation or political doctrine. Lest we forget Jesus says it rains on the just and, and the unjust. If you're saved, it's going to rain. If you're not saved, it's still going to rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We must not assume that our meek understanding of God's plan for our lives mm. gives us full and complete ownership and possession of who and what God is. God is free. Grace is wonderful. Ooh. And salvation is the ubiquitous divine gift open to everyone, everywhere. Just because the participants in the text of devout Jews did not mean that they saw the world the same way any more than 21st century followers of Jesus are a monolithic model of identical thought and belief. Difference does not mean deficient. Come on. Because you are different from me does not mean I'm less than or you're less than. When I think of the myriad sects of Christianity, there is something that I like about all of them. See, I want the social ministries of the Methodists and the strict theology of the Presbyterians. I want the pioneering protests of the Lutherans and the defiant spirit of Richard Allen and the AME Church. I want the commitment of social justice of the Catholics mm. and the intellectual honesty of the Unitarians. I want the gorgeous liturgy of the Episcopalians and the public conscience of the United Church of Christ. I want the spiritual fervor of the Pentecostals mm. and the marvelous freedoms of the Baptists. Mm. Meaninglessly pointing out differences does nothing to further the kingdom of God on earth. If you find the worship of the Episcopalians too formal, the, the worship tradition of the Baptists too long, mm. or the tradition of the Pentecostals too exuberant, then don't worship them. Mm. Go somewhere else. But mm. that should not mean that those traditions are wrong. Nor the people who realize God's comfort through those varying worship styles are wrong. This text, and importantly, the symbolism of the New Testament Pentecost, is what God intended for the church. They may have been devout Jews, they may have made up of different, many cultures, many origins, many races, and probably different variations on what it means to be a Jew.